data analytics, business intelligence, that's the core part of, you know, what we're doing and work, you know, my, my goal at Giraffe is, you know, when you think of BI traditionally, like the rightmost column on that chart was like, you know, yesterday's actuals. Our goal is that that's like the middle of every chart and then you can see where you're going. And everything that we do is focus on like, how do we make that just even faster, even easier to, to make, but also to share, to collaborate and to stress test those assumptions and be able to you know, tweak those different things. So today I want to welcome Martin Zitch. He is the CEO and one of the founders of Giraffe. You know, I always say to our customers, Martin and the Giraffe team, they're doing to the FP&A world what QuickBooks Online and Zero did to the bookkeeping world. I'm excited to have this conversation with Martin. So Growth Lab, we've been one of their partners for the last two and a half years. It's definitely a different mindset, but we love it because it does reduce some of the work that you'll find in spreadsheets. And, you know, Martin is at the forefront of helping the accounting advisory, small business world move from that traditional transactional advisory to more of that finance as a service mindset. And so today I'm excited to be talking to Martin. All right, Martin, this is a pleasure. I appreciate you joining us on the FAS evolution. So Martin, you just came back from scaling new heights, right? Yeah, it was, it was a great event. Yeah. It feels good to finally be out there, right? <laughs> yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of energy that people have pent up and they, uh, they all wanted to meet up again. So I'll tell you, I went down to uh, Jason Bloom's Thrival mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, this is nice. I'm actually out there with the peers again. I feast off of that, right? I enjoy it. So it was good to be out there with our peers. So today we have Martin, the CEO and co-founder of Giraffe. It's an all-in-one FP&A solution for companies who need growth-focused business planning software. Me personally, Martin, I always make this analogy with, with our customers, our mutual customers. I always say, you know, Giraffe is doing to the FP&A world what the QuickBooks and the Zeros did to the bookkeeping world, really transforming it and allowing, more importantly, practitioners to drive value at the most cost-effective, efficient way possible, because we all know what the dreaded spreadsheet can do. And so Martin actually, you know, experienced in financial industry, but you've also held roles as a financial analyst and financial director. So Martin, was that in sort of Fortune 500 type companies or more middle market companies? Actually, I worked for a, like a CFO consulting firm, and then we also did outsourced accounting and, and bookkeeping, and, um, and we'd work with a lot of high growth companies, so a lot of tech companies that you know, four people and a dog, and they're sitting around the dining room table, and they have an idea, and they want to raise a million bucks. They'd, they'd hire me, and that would help you know, build their model and then, and then start working on their dreams with them. So you kind of started your career very much like many of the channel partners, intermediaries that Giraffe has currently worked with. So you really understand the problem of scaling as a finance as a service firm, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Martin, you created Giraffe and, you know, this was what, back in 2015? Yeah, it was uh, like summer of 2015 when I left the, uh, the full-time gig to go into entrepreneurship here. We always see problems, right? We see opportunities, we see challenges, we say, ah, oh, I wish I had something for this. Was that how this all came about? Yeah, like this is, you know, this kind of all-in-one financial forecasting package it was something that I've been kind of dreaming of for a long, long time. I was scrolling through my Google photos and I looked at like 2011 and it like literally the, uh, something that was on a whiteboard is like what our configuration screen looks like now, you know? So it's, it's, it's been a long time in the making. Yeah, totally. And giraffe has come a long, long way. I believe the first time I met you in person at an actual conference was Countex or QBO connect uh, back in 2017. And you guys have obviously come a long way again, Martin, I appreciate you uh, joining us. I know you're busy and have had a, a long week. So part of the uh, podcast, the theme here, the FAS evolution, when I came into this world, I had spent 15 years in fortune 100, 200 type companies. I was fortunate enough to have done sales and marketing, but spent the bulk of my career in corporate finance, FP and a capital markets. 
And in 2013, I said to myself, okay, I'm, I've sort of had enough of that. And I was introduced to this world of like startups. And I realized like there's a lot of fractional CFOs and bookkeepers and stuff. How are you positioning Giraffe to work with practitioners to help them scale their business? Like how do you see Giraffe really being core to the tech stack? Just like QuickBooks and Xero is core to the tech stack of bookkeeping and accounting. How do you envision Giraffe being that core to the tech stack of an outsourced CFO firm. Interesting you mentioned the tech stack. So the, I think of it kind of like how engineers always talk about their tech stack, but accountants have a tech stack. And it's like, what's the GL you like to use? QuickBooks Zero, FinTech, that's sweet. You might say like, what's your my AP tool? You know, do I want to use build.com or, or something else and, and expenses? And then when you look at budgeting and forecasting, everyone always leans on Excel. There is no leader in this spot. So this is where our core goal is to be that primary forecasting tool for folks that's, you know, agnostic to the GL that they're on, that can grow with them as they grow. And we've, we've done a lot in the outsourced accounting community as well, because we're, we're actually the preferred budgeting and forecasting provider of CPA.com and that ASCPA. I want to get a little bit deeper here, if I may. You know, we have, we've had a few years of experience. We see a lot of young entrepreneurs starting up their companies, taking on huge challenges, right? So here's a question for you, Martin. What is one piece of advice you would give to your younger self, say 10 years ago? You know, I bet, you know, we're all working in uh, as entrepreneurs. We're super ambitious and we want to do everything. In the beginning, I would just try to take on everything, work like 18 hour days and, and crank through. If you've got a jar and you want to fill it up and you've got sand and you've got some little rocks and pebbles, the way you do it is you put the big rocks in first, then the little pebbles then the sand comes in last and fills in all the gaps. Mm -hmm. So this is a key thing where I wish I did better was focus on the big rocks. Like if you're only going to accomplish one big thing for this month or this quarter or this day, you know, uh, just only focus on that. Don't let the little stuff stress you out. And if you do that, you will have step function, you know, whatever you're working on and been able to move, you know, move that forward. And, and, and I put that in practice uh, actually to this day now block the first 90 minutes of my day. That's it. It's my top priority item. I don't look at email. I don't do anything else. And then if I do that, I know I've been successful for the day and then the rest will all flow through. I agree with you. Like focusing on the big rock. I mean, I love the small stuff too. Don't get me wrong. But if I could go back in time and I'm not even talking like a younger, younger self, but even at the onset of my entrepreneurial journey, I think if I could have focused on that one big rock that drives the greatest intrinsic value, I think we'd all be better off, right? I, I yep. probably would have chipped away a few years at uh, our, our scaling and our growth. But, you know, you learn as you get older, right? Yeah. And so now let's kind of like hypothesize a little bit here. So if you could start a new company, DeNovo, what would it be? And would it be focused on the accounting industry? And it can't be giraffe. It can't, can't be the second version of giraffe. It can't be the second version of giraffe. So I would... You know, drafts my baby and it feels like I'm starting, you know, a new company every year we're growing and it's evolving so fast and it's so crazy. If I had to start another one, um, I would definitely go with another animal theme because <laughs> I love, I love animals and the, and the spirit that embodies in, in those ones. And then in regards to the accounting profession, I think there's so, so much of a green field within analytics, data, and I'd like the future of work. So there's huge opportunities around that. I, I can think of probably like five or 10 startups that are there to be made in accounting to this day that, that someone's got to work on it. you will solve some tough problems here. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, you look at the world of say marketing and digital marketing. So we do have customers that we offer digital marketing services for. And the first question I usually get is what is a bunch of accountants or a bunch of finance people do in marketing? And I say, well, marketing has to start with data. I mean, just like finance, you know, business intelligence, it all starts with data. Decision-making starts with data. The, all the other stuff, like we tend to focus too much maybe on the creativity stuff and not enough on the underlying data that drives the big why. What, you know, what, what's the purpose of this decision? What's the thing? Same thing in like financial planning, right? You could sit here all day on my whiteboard and blue sky all day long, but if it's not grounded in some sort of data and then translated into a story, then you're no better off, right? Yep. So I love that you said that like, 
what about business intelligence? Like, how do you see, or do you see business intelligence? Cause that's sort of the, the, you know, the big one right now. Like, where do you see business intelligence falling into the product development roadmap at uh, giraffe? Data analytics, business intelligence, that's a core heart of, you know, what we're doing and we're, you know, my, my goal at giraffe is, you know, when you think of BI traditionally, like the rightmost column on that chart was like, you know, yesterday's actuals. Our goal is that that's like the middle of every chart and then you can see where you're going and everything that we do is focus on like how do we make that just even faster even easier to to make but also to share to collaborate and to stress test those assumptions and be able to you know, tweak those different things yeah i never understood that because i agree with you i guess it was second nature for me uh, in building my own models and in, in spreadsheets maybe accountants just treated it differently but you always had the actuals first and then your rolling forecast, you know, uh, you would, f you know, roll it out forward to the right. And you guys have built that right into giraffe. Yeah, we, we built it, you know, that's the core, like that's the backbone of every model is let's get that data set in from all the transactional tools we use and then join it really elegantly and easily. And then from there, um, start doing magic with it. Like I said, we sort of started this journey, not as CPAs or as accountants, not having spent any time in public accounting, this whole notion of like billable hours feels like mercenary, right? That, that's just not who we were. I always just kind of got a paycheck every Friday, right? Until I started, started this company, you know, but over time we realized that there really is this power of finance as a service and that the transactional world of accounting is maybe kind of like being left behind. But I see value in being that extension of the management team, providing the finance accounting value stream, not just going in there as a management consulting and telling everybody how to do it, you know, the right way, but actually going in there and, and doing it. We like to say that we're sort of focused on changing one accounting customer into a fast customer, right? One customer at a time without putting you too much on the spot. You know, what's one thing about the accounting industry? If you want to just kind of throw everybody into this accounting industry, what's one thing that you think really needs to be changed or maybe will be, you know, what you think will change? Well, like one thing that I'm, I'm super excited about, there's changes coming to the CPA exam and they're adding more on business analytics and more on technology. And this is something that I've always seen lacking because people would have just, you know, you get an accounting, they're like, all right, I can do bank recs, I can tick and tie for audit and how to do tax stuff. But like the real value, like the reason we do accounting is not just to crank out reports and get your taxes done. It's, it's to help drive strategic decision making. So if we can do that faster and then actually, you know, and then this is actually a word of advice for that I give to everyone that's early in their accounting career is don't try to be this gopher that just grabs reports really fast and emails them through lost. Do that and actually take a look at the numbers, digest it, and then give a hypothesis of this is what I'm seeing in the data. And that's, you know, helping folks make these decisions. That's that's what we want to be able to do. So if the audience could see me smiling, it's because I always tell my analysts, own the data. You have to own it, right? Don't just regurgitate it. Just don't print it out. Just don't email it out like you're saying, right? You have to own the data. You have to understand it, understand the in intricacies, right? The, the relationship of the data. I would say even most accountants, yeah, in theory, they may understand that the cash flow, the P and L, the balance sheet are all interrelated. That I don't think they fully appreciate the relationship between the trifecta of those three statements. And I really try to get my analysts to own the data. As you kind of look back in your career, what was that inflection point for you? I mean, obviously, you didn't just wake up one day at 22 and say, you know, I'm a I'm a finance guy, I'm a finance whiz, right? What would you say was that inflection point or that experience in your 20s or 30s that really put the bubbles in your beer? There was a, a project I did where I remember I, I had my first job, I was a, like a project manager at a market research company and, you know, fresh out of college, you're just learning how to hook up the printer and to just do anything. And, you know, but then I remember um, like the, the managing director there comes on and he's like, hey, Martin, 
you, you did a finance degree, right? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, that means you know Excel, right? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then he gave me a project and he had me start doing this analytics. And then I didn't know, you know, it's your first, first job out of college and that, that I was like figuring it out. And then really quickly, it started growing, growing, growing. Fast forward about like two and a half years there, I think we built like an automated um, forecasting platform based off of like all their RFP data and when it came in and historical win rates and then segmentation and stuff. And I was able to like predict revenue like nine months in advance within like a few percent margin of error. And mm -hmm. that was kind of the aha moment where it's like, all right, like, cool. I got the reports that he was asking, but then I started digesting it and started automating it and planning from that. And that like pushed me into this world of financial modeling and, and everything from there. So we talked about things that need to be changed in accounting. You brought up some of your own experience. If I was new to this and I was a CPA or an accountant that was focused more on traditional accounting services, what's like step one, step two in your mind to getting me, our audience, from being, you know, just press send, send the report mm -hmm. to more of that interpret own the data, help forecast, help link historicals with business strategy. There's a, um, there's, there's two parts to this. One is understanding the receiver of the data that you're trying to pull this for. So if it's for yourself or if it's for, you know, a client or your boss is understanding their goals. And if you don't know, like we can, you know, that this is the number one, like people say, how do I get an advisor? I say, ask whoever you're working with, just say, what are your goals for next year, next quarter, then just shut up, be quiet and let that awkward silence happen and see what words come out of their mouth. And then people will, will start you know, telling, oh, I want to double the company or I want to be cash flow positive, I want to grow. But then you go, all right, what are the actions that have to happen to do that? And then they start going, well, I got to hire these people. And then you say, well, you know, what are the unit economics or the metrics of these people? Then really quickly. That's the drivers of the plan. That's the financial model. You've just teased out of someone asking three questions. Then you go at it and, and, you know, put it in a spreadsheet, put it in an app like draft, you know, do whatever. But so when you pull now that data and you're looking at accounting data, you know, just think what are the underlying things that move these numbers? Is it more humans? Was it more of whatever, you know, customers, more units that are there? Because everything's unit times price equals whatever it's the dollar in QuickBooks or zero for everything. And when you start understanding those unit economics, then the little, you know, cartoon light bulb pops up above your head and, and get that aha moment. And, and as you start learning to, to work with that, that's, that's where the stuff just starts growing from there. I love it because we define the annual strategic business cycle, right? That's things that are deliverable throughout the year or during, you know, specific times, you know, specific months throughout the year. But what you just described is the starting point for any plan build out. We internally call it goal deployment planning, GDP. And it's exactly what you just described, where you have the long range plan. What are my long range goals? I want to double my revenue fivefold, whatever it may be in five years. Okay, great. And then therefore my annual operating plan, in order for me to make sure I'm on that five year journey, my annual operating plan for next year kind of needs to be connected to that. And once you start asking people, your customers, exactly what you just said, what are your five-year goals? So, okay, great. That sounds good. So what does next year's goal have to be to make sure that we're on that path? Okay, that makes sense. Then what are those things you got to actually do? Like processes, like what do you actually got to do? I got to go higher. I got to go do this or that. And then your last thing that you mentioned, Martin, was, well, I got to measure it right? How do I know I'm actually succeeding? And those measurements, those KPIs, those whatever, those metrics, that I'm with you, man. That's exactly what you need to be building towards, right? You're building a plan towards those. Those are the drivers, right? Yep, exactly. We're all in this to help entrepreneurs. You having been a fractional CFO, fractional controller, having done this for other entrepreneurs and now starting your own company. After doing this for about a decade, Martin, we all have some advice for these businesses. So two questions. One, what type of business would you advise? What type of businesses, business models, industries would you actually want to be advising? And two, what's one mistake or opportunity you see business owners making? In terms of the businesses that I like to advise, I think 
I love recurring revenue businesses and, you know, make anything as a service. You could take something that used to be really expensive and amortize it out over a long time and, and make it really sticky and make it add value for folks. So SaaS businesses, that's like, I, I live and breathe that stuff as well as IOT where you have some hardware component, but then you got that recurring service around it. So those, those ones are ones yeah, I think I agree. phenomenal. Um, and I love to work with companies like that. I think the big one that I see is people really underestimate how hard it is to build a business and what that means in terms of, you know, the people you need, how long it takes to ramp folks up and, and to hit those milestones. So there's so many, like it's like there's stats, like nine out of 10 businesses fail You get, you know, uh, it's small businesses in the first like two years or something. And I think, um, if folks took that planning into mind and then actually were, you know, patted it a little bit and, and thought through a little bit more on that or leaned on mentors that have been there. I, I bet you like, if we do this, right, we could, we could move that number up and make a lot more people successful. Yeah. And it starts with planning, right? Yep. Exactly. Staffing roadmaps, you know, not just saying here I am current state, here's my future state. I'm just going to go from A to B, but you know, how are you going to go from A to B? What's that journey? And by the way, it's a multifaceted journey. It's like five, six swim lanes to get to point B and each swim lane needs its own roadmap, right? Its own like execution roadmap. I mean, if I were to answer that question, I really enjoy working with small, medium size operating businesses. I love the venture back world. I love startups. It's great. I love monthly recurring revenue SaaS businesses, but I love operating companies. One is actual free cash flow. And I love free cash flow because there's a lot you can do with free cash flow. They've probably been like through the ringer. And we're not talking just two years, you know, going from C to Series A, but they've probably been in it since their kids were in diapers. The kids are graduating out of college, right? They've been in it for 10, 20 years. Um, and things get old and stale. Uh, and so I feel like with operating businesses, there's a lot of opportunity, especially to introduce tools like Giraffe and, and planning, bringing planning back. And I also would add, I feel like those operating businesses, when they think of planning, they're always thinking of tax planning. And it's just like, no, 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 no. You got to think about business, business strategy and financial management planning. And then the tax is the problem you want to have, right? Monthly recurring revenue. It's a great business model. And I don't know what you would think about this, Martin, but I feel if there's one transformation that can happen in the accounting industry, it is moving from more of that transactional accounting, transactional priced to a more recurring revenue price structure in the accounting industry. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing from like all the highest growth kind of accounting firms. They've all just kind of value, value price, they bundle, you know, here's, you're going to get all this stuff and we're going to make you successful. And then, you know, you, you revisit it once every year or six months or whatever, but kind of bake that in and it just lets you move so much faster. And then clients don't feel nickel and dime. You can plan appropriately and they can. And, and I think that's where the whole industry is going. Yeah. And of course, you know, I've, I've done a, a few webinars with uh, the giraffe team and the last one in the CPA.com, the last one I had done with you guys and CPA.com was all about recruiting and staffing up for this, this function. And what you just said is spot on. If I don't have an understanding of the customer demand, how the heck am I going to be able to staff up to meet that demand? And I'm, I'm with you. Like the best way to do it is to transition from hourly to a more monthly fixed price. Martin, one last thing. So what do you say to the practitioner who goes, right, but I can never seem to scope it right. I can never, like this whole notion of productizing my FP&A or productizing my accounting, that's, I, I'm just not successful there. And I feel like more so than not, the customer's taken advantage, scope creep. How do you help a customer? How do you help a practitioner deal with that? What's your advice? Um, what I think, you know, the, the core part is kind of maybe this is another part of where people do that value-based billing, but even bucket it in another, you know, two tiers or three tiers. And here's, you get, you know, X, Y, Z with this and you have some upper bound, like, Hey, and you know, if there's some, uh, some catch-all bucket, we'll, you know, we'll have that conversation, but 
know, putting tiers around it, that gives you guardrails on there. So it might be, you know, tier one, I'm going to help you do your books and you get your taxes filed every year and we'll do your quarterly tax return, you know, sales tax stuff. Tier two, we're doing that. Plus we're adding, you know, uh, you know, uh, budget versus actual meeting every quarter. And we've got that in there and tier three could be, Hey, if we've got to go do a financing, some big one-off project, you know, we could talk, we can solve for that, but it'll always be then your tier and you have a little catch all in case, in case you get a, a curveball thrown at you. Right. And so fear not like the gross margin volatility, because that's the least of your worries in, in this business. I think that the, the greatest risk to our business is the people side mm -hmm. and managing capacity utilization. That's tough in our business because at the end of the day, Martin, right? Uh, me and my our peers, we're still a, a human capital business, right? That's what we do. We deploy human capital. Mm -hmm. Our customers consume that, and use, utilizing tools like Giraffe helps us uh, mitigate some of the risks, uh, removes efficiencies, the rework that can happen with the dreaded spreadsheets everything from version control to needle in a haystack, finding that wrong formula, right? How, yep. many of us, how many of us have not gotten caught with our pants down right before a meeting and we're like, why isn't this model tying out? And it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, analysts, you know, misplaced the formula or hard coded something, right? In the, mm -hmm. in the drivers. One last thing. So an observation, sort of crystal ball from you. How do you see giraffe changing the accounting industry? The way we're already influencing the accounting industry and that we're, we're further doing it is really giving that, you know, like, like you mentioned within staffing, being able to provide a very simple, easy way to kind of leverage all the skills and the knowledge that you have as accountants. You see hundreds of clients and be able to, to, to give those recommendations at advisory level there. So, you know, we're, we're helping firms like this nonstop. This is what we do day in, day out. Um, and we've actually created a lot of education around this too. So with us, we're not just, here's some software, here's, you know, we'll actually go through and training and teach. And we're, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we're paving the way for where the whole industry is going on that side. Yeah. And so when do you think we're going to have uh, GiraffeCon 2022? <laughs> you know, now that the world's opening up, I have, I found, I found a resort that has giraffe statues all around it in the U S and I am, uh, looking into it. I don't know if we can pull it off for 2022, but there is a giraffe themed resort and I'm, uh, looking into it now. That's funny. Well, we, we do look forward to the day that giraffe has an advisory board, big fans of you guys looking forward to the great things coming out. I just want to say, you know, thank you for having me on here. It's great. You know, great talking shop with you on this stuff. And, you know, I, I love to just geek out on FP and a all day. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Appreciate it. So that's this week's FAS Evolution. We really do appreciate you joining us. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out at growthlabfinancial.com.